Hi, hi everybody. This is Lou Adler. You probably, most of you have not heard my voice before, uh, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm actually reading some of the questions that are coming through here. And quite honestly, we're going to be actually answering many of those. Uh, the one about why can't we start on time, I'm uh, probably not going to answer that one. Um, but I'll talk fast to make up for it. Uh, but what I want to do is I uh, kind of introduce you to my book. And it's, this is not an infomercial. We're actually going to go into a lot of content. But a lot of the content that I'm going to talk about is extracted from the book. Most of the time, I speak to talent leaders in companies, and recruiters in companies. And that's our business. That's our business. We help companies find and hire people. And we use uh, concepts in my book. And we do this worldwide. The latest book I wrote, The Essential Guide for Hiring and Getting Hired, came out earlier this year. I wanted to put a book together that also spoke to job seekers, but the, the emphasis was on interviewers, hiring managers, and recruiters. But I also know they don't do the right stuff. So throughout the book, I say, hey, if, we, if they do what I say for them to do in the book, you're going to be OK. But quite frankly, most of them won't do it. So you, then, the job seeker, has to take matters into your own hands. That's what I want to talk about today is what do you have to do to get in the game? What do you have to do to take matters in your own hand? And that book was a little bit hard to write from that perspective. Uh, I also, and you'll get an email on this, so the last infomercial component, just put together a full job series, video job series, on a lot of the topics we're talking about. We set this program up with Open Sesame. We have a uh, URL there that you can check out. The first five minutes of this job series is no cost, and you'll discover that we're giving an 80% discount. I'm not. Open Sesame is giving it a very cool marketing to, to launch the program. So you might want to just check it out, at least listen to the first five minutes. Uh, I do speak slower in that five minutes. I do have a tendency to speak rapidly, uh, and I'll try to do my best to speak slower. It is hard for me to do when I get excited. Uh, regardless, though, I do want to answer all your questions. I want to kind of set the stage here of what we're going to be doing today. Well, let's kind of also do this. Uh, we're going to have a uh, Twitter feed, so our hashtag will be uh, hashtag HeadhunterLA. So as I say stuff that you think is relevant or irrelevant, put that in there, uh, and we'll kind of go from there. So let me set the stage of what we're going to do. It, it turns out I might not get everything done because of the depth of the questions, but nonetheless, we'll cover a heck of a lot of stuff here. The first thing I want to do is introduce you to what I call the 2020-60 job hunting plan. Basically, it says is don't spend 100% of your time applying for jobs because it's a waste of time. At most, 20%. But even then, I want you to use the job postings as leads. The most of it, 20% uh, on job replying to ads. 60% is on networking. We'll really get into that. I'll also, talk about what's the 10-second resume because literally, if you get, uh, if your resume is seen <clears throat> for the first time, somebody will only look at it for 10 seconds, and you better make sure that those seconds, what you present in 10 seconds is what you want to be present so that they'll read it at least for 30 seconds. We'll also discuss briefly getting ready for the interview. How do you, if you do get an interview, how do you do well in the interview? So we'll kind of get into that aspect as well. And also, how do you make sure you're properly assessed? So we'll get into all of these things, some in more depth, some in less depth, but you'll get a sense that they're covered in the book, they're covered in the video, and they'll be covered here today. And as I understand it, we are recording this class. We actually have an earlier one. Uh, we're going to put out one of the either this video or the, the earlier one, the recording of the class. We'll put it out so you'll at least get it. Uh, one of the videos that you can listen to this class. If there's anything worthy of repeating anyway, you'll have a chance to take a look at it. I'll also make the statement that I'm pretty frank, pretty direct. Uh, so feel free to ask your questions. But I'm going to give you honest, straightforward answers. For the last 25 years, I've been working, and I still, as recent as yesterday evening, uh, working with companies who want to hire people. I talk to their talent leaders. I talk to their recruiters. I talk to their company presidents. I talk to their uh, executives. And I talk to the head of their HR department. So I'm giving you the perspective of what goes on inside people who uh, make hiring decisions. And they sometimes don't make them that effectively. Let me start off by saying how a job is filled so you get a sense of the two fundamentally different markets. When a manager opens up a rec, I don't care if it's for an engineer, or software developer, or marketing person, it doesn't matter what the job is. If it's not officially opened yet, they think about, hey, who do I know for this job? And they just think about it. And there's a lot of flexibility. And they try to 
I'll say, who do I personally know who could do this job? Because I've worked with this person, this person, or that person. If that doesn't work, they expand it to people who maybe they don't personally know, but somebody in their company knows, the employee referral program. But the idea is when you get referred, the judgment is usually on your performance and potential, not a direct fit for the job. It's the hidden job market. The reason for that is, is that, hey, if you promote somebody, you promote them based on their performance and ability to grow, you don't even, of course they don't have the right skills because they're getting promoted. So by definition, it's based on their performance. Once the job becomes public, if they can't fill it based on someone they know or someone they know knows somebody, it then goes into the public market and all the compliance stuff takes place. They've got to put a rec together. They've got to list a bunch of skills and responsibilities now. Uh, and they post the job on some job board uh, and re recruiters start looking for resumes. Approximately 50% of jobs are filled in the hidden market, another 50% hidden the public market. In the public market, it's based on matching skills and experience. In the hidden market, it's based on performance and potential. So that's why I tell people, you got to spend 60% of your time getting found in the hidden market. And we're going to talk about networking, and that's networking. And networking isn't about meeting lots of people. It's about meeting a few people who can vouch for you and have them recommend you to other people. And have those people recommend you to other people. It's not about meeting as many people as you can. That's a waste of time, not almost a waste. It's, it's almost as much of a waste of time as applying directly to a job. Another 20% of your uh, Efforts should be making sure your resume can be found. If you're found, you're given a little bit of freedom. Hey, I found this person. This looks pretty good. They're still going to judge you on skills and experience, but when your resume is found, boy, you better make sure it's, it's read. So when you get to some part of the top of the resume stack or you apply, uh, what your resume stands out and what it says, and you've got 10 seconds to make that pitch, absolutely critical. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. The other 20% of your job is looking for jobs online, but not necessarily applying to all of them. Only apply to those you're a perfect match. Because if you're not a perfect match, the systems behind that do the matching, it's not even a person, some system matches your skills listed to the job description skills. And if they're not a fit, you don't get brought even to the top of the list. But you can certainly use that job posting, ah, this company's looking for three different people. Maybe I can find somebody in my network and get me referred into that. LinkedIn shows you a lot of those connections. So, uh, and I'm not here to advertise LinkedIn Premium Solution, but I know uh, it definitely does show some of the connections you can use. So it's a useful tool from that standpoint. So let me just set the stage of the 2020-60 plan. Obviously, I can't talk about everything in it. We could spend two hours on each one of those components, but I'm going to highlight some of those. Let me then really talk about networking, and what I'll do is I'll open up the questions after this one, what networking is about. Let me start, because this is the 60%. Let me suggest that networking is not about meeting lots of people. Uh, it's about meeting a few people who can vouch for your performance. Because if people can vouch for your performance, you're going to get a better job in the hidden market. Because there's a lot of flexibility in the hidden market. If somebody meets you, then all of a sudden they're meeting you because you were recommended by someone whom they trusted there's a little bit more flexibility so they can actually craft the job around you. In the public market, you've got to fit the skills in the job. It's, hey, this is the job. We've, we've wrecked it. Now, they've got a little bit of flexibility, but recruiters don't have a lot of flexibility in the public market. They're working, corporate recruiters working anywhere from 20 to 30, sometimes even 40 requisitions at one time, pure transactional. If you don't fit the bill, uh, fine. You've got to go on to the next one. They just have so much work to do, so they find it frustrating also. So, Getting a job in the hidden market, you have to do through networking. So here's how I suggest. I'm going to open up the questions because I know uh, we had in our previous call a similar topic. It became a very important point. Networking is about finding three to five close connections, people who can vouch for your performance. Former boss, former coworker, someone you work on the outside, a vendor, accountant, lawyer, some people you know, professor, some people who can vouch for your performance, and your job is to meet that person one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to review your resume with that person. We're going to give you some tips on how to review it, so that makes perfect sense. Hey, what do you think of this? And we're going to show you the 10-second rule. And then ask that person, who do they know who can vouch for your performance, for their performance? 
who can uh, do they know who they would recommend you to? And then you're going to meet with those people. Review your resume with them and get two to three more names. This is hard, hard, hard work, but it's worthwhile work. Applying to a job is not hard work, but it's a waste of time. It's just like buying, you can buy a thousand lottery tickets, you're not going to get win the lottery. That's what you will, and then you'll write a story, oh, I won the lottery. Yeah, but not everyone's going to win the lottery. This is how networking is done. It's not about meeting lots of people and hoping that somebody's looking for a job. I mean, it, I mean, that's not to say you shouldn't do that, but don't make that your emphasis of networking. 60% is on hard work, meeting people, putting your ego on the line, getting them to meet with you, uh, asking for other people they know. And if you can look on LinkedIn and their profile, sometimes you can see their connections on LinkedIn. Or you can see what companies they work for. Hey, these people know these people. Just sometimes you can look at recommendations on LinkedIn. You see a lot of people they know. So there's ways you can use LinkedIn uh, to begin your networking. We figure, hey, how can I pull this off? But you have to start with three to five close connections who can vouch for your performance. That's a game changer. Because when someone can vouch for your performance, your skills and experience don't have to be perfect. So let me open it up there. I know this is a very important topic, and I want to spend some time on it, JJ. Yeah, we have a lot of people on the call who are uh, just entering the job market, uh, recent college graduates. So how do you create a network if you don't already have a professional network in place? Okay, let me just make the, look for another question here. But I'm going to give a story that I told earlier. About nine months ago, I'm going to say it was the first quarter of this year, I get an email from a professor at Loyola Marymount in Southern California. The email basically said, and I don't remember the name of the person, but this is the resume of my best marketing student this year. I looked at the resume, and it was adequate, nothing remarkable. But the fact that this professor went out of his way and sent that re email to me, I said, I've got to talk to this person. turned out that he wasn't appropriate for the job he had, but nonetheless, I talked to the person. And he was a good person once I talked to him on the phone. The resume was un unremarkable. Uh, that person who sent me the email, I hadn't met that. I mean, literally, this person was at a webcast or some presentation I made 10 years ago. Uh, but I do remember the name. Obviously, it was on his list. So professors are one, one way to do it. If you've had a part-time job, that's one way to do it. If you've been an intern, that's one way to do it. The idea is that every single job you have is not just a job. You've got to demonstrate. You've got to look at the, hey, I'm working at this company. You're meeting 5 or 10 or 15 people, even an intern job. Are you working hard? Are you reliable? Are you consistent? Are you making things happen? Are you going out of way to, to go the extra mile? Those are the things that, yeah, this was a good person in that experience I had. So if you don't have those, if you're 22 or 23 and don't have any of those experiences, I said, you've got to take some job. And listen to Anton Kutcher. He says, hey, take every job is an important job. And he is absolutely right. I had chills when I read that comment. Every job is important. And I remember working in a warehouse when I was a kid. The president of the company, I mean, I worked overtime. I, did, I got paid for it, but I worked overtime. Uh, and that guy recommended me to other people for the next summer job. I didn't even ask him. It just happened that I uh, knew that everything you do is important. So build every time you have a connection, uh, demonstrate that person you're worthwhile. And I can't spend more time than that on it, but that's how I would start with a, uh, someone who doesn't have a lot of work experience. Any other questions, JJ? On, yeah, on we have some let's, let's a couple more on networking. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a few. Uh, we've got some folks who are trying to move into different industries. Do you recommend uh, trying to establish a network in a different industry, or how do you network into that industry with your current network? Yeah, I think that's a good good question. I think in this case, and this is what I so now we kind of kind of go back is I don't think industry is all that important. Unfortunately, it is important from a the way the public market works, because people say they look for experience, they look for skills, they look for industry background. And that's the algorithms and the systems that res match your resume to the job opening, consider that. From a networking standpoint, you might want to consider, so if let's assume you've got five to ten years experience. You hope if you've got an accounting firm, just as an example, your accountant your accountant obviously has other clients in other industries. So they're going to look at so you might want to approach the accountant. Most accounting firms have anywhere from 10 to 30 accountants. They've got small business clients generally or big business clients depending on it, but that's just somebody who's well networked in other industries. In that case, you've got to demonstrate that you're good at what you do. It's not the industry that makes you good. If you're a product marketing person, it's not that you're good at uh, product marketing in this industry. There's a lot of relevance to, to that work in other industries. So you've got to look at your performance 
some of the accomplishments you've had and see what industries could those same skills be applied in other industries. I tended as a recruiter, which is kind of irrelevant to this conversation, but I tended to work with accountants uh, early on when I was a recruiter. The reason is that they weren't so industry specific. Obviously, if someone was a manufacturing, they had, it didn't matter what kind of manufacturing. If they're financial services, it didn't matter what kind of financial services. So, but what I really did is I looked at their background and said, okay, what have I accomplished that is applicable to other industries? And then make the story around the accomplishment. So then, so let me kind of just take it one step further. You see a job posting for a marketing job or a job that's slightly irrelevant uh, or slightly different than your background, slightly different than your industry, I guarantee you're not going to get interviewed if you apply. However, you might be able to uh, use the back door. You might actually look on, hey, who is the director of marketing? Who's the director of operations? Who's running the warehouse? Maybe I can send that person a copy of this document. You can send that person an email through LinkedIn. You can look that person up somewhere, probably uh, call the person up. You can probably look and figure out what kind of what their email address is. But if you can uh, figure out, hey, here's how I've accomplished something that's unrelated to not from not unrelated to the work they need done, but unrelated to the industry, then use that uh, nice story, write up, whatever it may be, try to get in the back door. So that's how I look. Focus on your performance, find that's applicable, that's cross industry, and then figure out how do you get in networking through the back door. Let me keep on going here, JJ. I don't wanna wanna make sure we cover everything. We'll get back to some of this, but I think we're uh, we've covered those points at least reasonably well. Um, so let me kind of just go through the basics of getting a job and interviewing, and I'll, we'll cover some of these in more these points in more depth than others. This one I'm going to cover in some depth here, so I just want to highlight it now. You need to have a 10-second resume. It doesn't really mean that it's 10 seconds long. What it means is that when someone looks at your resume, you only gonna, they're only going to look at it for 10 seconds, and if in that 10 seconds, that first blush, it doesn't stand out, the content they want, you're not going to get, they're not going to read it for 30 seconds. So you got 10 seconds to, uh, the first time someone looks at your resume to decide if they're going to even go deeper or not. The second component is when you do get into an interview, you better be prepared. And I tell my candidates when I was doing this all the time, which was 10 to 15 times a week setting up interviews, I said, you better get prepared for three to four hours. This is not a game. If I send you out as a recruiter to my client, you now represent me, which is, that was me having a standard. In my mind, each of you has a standard of performance, and you better be effective. And if you've ever made a business presentation, uh, most people would spend three to four hours, if not longer, 10 hours to make a business presentation to their boss or the business group. Well, an interview is just as important, so you've got to be prepared. I'll give you some tips in a moment on how to get ready for it and how to answer questions. I'm gonna, I'll kind of highlight this right now, and I'll say it again probably one or two times casually. I just don't have time to dig into everything. Don't let yourself be box checked, meaning if you see somebody going through how many years of this, how many years of that, unless you're perfect fit, it's over. So what I always ask people is uh, if you see your, yourself being box checked, say, could you tell me a little about the job, some of the, how you're going to measure the person's performance or some of the challenges in the job? I'd like to give you some ideas of some work I've done related to that. Now, I'm going to say this again when I tell you how to answer questions, which I'll do in a minute. But I just want to set the stages. If you're being box checked and you're not, you don't have enough boxes checked, you're over. So you've got to take matters in your own hands. You just can't let that happen. And then towards the end of the interview, you might, and I'm probably not going to get to this. So I'm just going to just say this. I just don't have, won't have time to get to this given everything else. I'll make the pitch. It's in the book. It's in the videos. Uh, how do you determine if you're even going to be invited back to the next interview? I probably shouldn't even put it there, but I did because I thought it was important. But there is a way to do it, but it's not here. It's in the book. Uh, so now let me kind of talk about the 10-second resume. Uh, here's what this entails. It's, a, it's kind of a good exercise. So if you have a printed resume, and then you're going to uh, kind of push this off to LinkedIn to see if it would make sense, is take your resume printed, turn it over, or fold it, give it to somebody, get a stopwatch it's on your iPhone, give it to somebody and tell them to turn it over and circle everything they see, but they're only going to have 10 seconds to look at that, then have them hand it back to you, then look at the resume and see what the person has circled. If it's not enough compelling information there, I guarantee the 
recruiter or person looking at your resume won't give it another glance. The goal of this 10 seconds is for them to look at it for another 30 seconds. Another 30 seconds are looking at a little more in depth. What I'm looking for in these 10 seconds, roughly, and I only got 10 seconds, is something stand out that's compelling. On a LinkedIn profile, it's the line underneath your name. If that line underneath your name isn't compelling, and I looked at, I'm doing one search right now, I looked at about 50 or 60 uh, profiles just last night. And I'm looking at that first line. The first thing that catches my eye is the line. If that's okay, then I'm just going to start looking down. What I'm looking for in my own mind as a recruiter, and I know recruiters do this. They don't do it exactly the way I do it. But I'm looking at how, much, how many years of experience does this person have in total, just trying to get a rough feel for it. And is the work they're doing uh, above that level? Have they got five years' experience? Are they doing 10 years' worth of work? Are they got five years' experience and doing one year's worth of work? So I'm trying to just get this rough idea of, is this person in the top half or the bottom half? Do they have a track record that makes sense? Are they working for companies that are credible? Do they have the right academics given the job I've got? Now, all of these things are important, but if you don't get past the first 10 seconds, it doesn't really matter how good you are because you just won't get in the game. And this is, again, one of the reasons why I do not like uh, people applying for a job. Unless you're a perfect fit, you're not going to get to the top of the list. And the list comes out literally, guys, on these systems that I've seen them. I help uh, architects, some of them. Um, you got 100, 100 names there with some kind of ranking. You then click the name and you see some pop-up which gives you 10 seconds of information. Is that the information you want popped up? And literally, recruiters will look at the first 30 or 40, see if there's anybody there. If not, they'll move on. In some way, it's really unfair. Um, but that's the way it is, so neither here nor there. It's unfair. So this is what I call the 10-second review. Take a 3 by 5 card. Put your best stuff on that 3 by 5 This is the stuff I want and then try to capture that in your full resume. In your LinkedIn profile, make sure that subtitle uh, underneath your name, that's your branding statement. Make sure it stands out. I remember one that said something like Java coach. And just the fact that somebody was Java, which was okay, but the, the person put the word coach. Coach all of a sudden had some appeal to me. Obviously, that means they're collaborating. People who are coaches, obviously, are technically capable. Uh, now, now, I have to validate that, of course, as a recruiter or an interviewer, but nonetheless, it seem to make sense. JJ, any questions on this interviewing stuff? I think it's important. I can't spend a heck of a lot of time on it, but we certainly spend some time on it. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions, actually, about the resume itself. Uh, how can you address employment gaps that are recession-related on your resume so that it doesn't, kicked out if, it doesn't get kicked out based on those gaps if you're a quality person? Okay, so that's not, um, that I can't answer directly uh, because it will stand out. What I would then probably try to do is, in the 10 seconds, if it's, if it's clear, like there's a year and a half gap and people, uh, let's make, if you don't put the months down on your resume, everybody believes there's a gap. Everyone knows that, okay, it was really uh, 2009, November, I got laid off, I didn't find another job till uh, 2000 and uh, the next year. And when you just put years down, the assumption is there's a gap there. So that's, and so just, that's what people are going to assume. Right or wrong, that's what they assume. Uh, but you, what you might want to do if you have a gap, now let me kind of, I'm going to step back and I'll step forward. When I, if I was talking to this person who had a gap, I'm going to ask them, what did you do during that gap period? What did you do during the gap period? And if they goofed off, they played around, they complained, they made excuses, and they didn't do something to get better at what they're doing, I'm going to, Blow them up. He's not getting, sorry guys, I might not tell you that way, but I'm telling this group collectively, that's what happens. If on the other hand, if the person said, I went back to school, I did this online training, uh, MIT had this new program on such and such, and I took three online classes, and I really liked the one that I took at Pepperdine versus the one at MIT, but UCLA came up with this new one. But if they're really getting better, so they use that time in the gap to become better at what they're doing, I'm going to go, that's pretty cool. And I'm not, the gap will not be nearly as important. I might still want to find out why they got laid off and all those things, but if they decided to get better, I'm looking, then I, heck, this person's got character, personal development, responsibility committed, is committed for them to be a strong employee and a fine person. Now, I would probably then, now I'm thinking, now I'm going back to the first question, is I'd probably take that information about the gap and turn it into a positive, not a negative. But one of the things you have to do is you have negatives, you've got to at least neutralize them or turn them into strengths. In this case, you've got a gap, and you might want to just say, during this period from A to B, 
I did A, B, and C, and D. You say, ooh, that's pretty cool. So now you've neutralized the gap. You've actually turned it into a strength. So that's kind of the, how I'd handle that. I mean, there's obviously there's a, hundreds of different ways of doing it, but the con concept is probably similar in all cases. Let's say I want to keep on going, JJ, because we, I just know we're not going to have time to do everything, guys. Uh, okay. Just the way it is. We've got an hour. We can't cover everything. Let me kind of go to this part because I really want to talk about point two, which is being prepared. And the general statement is you have to prove your strengths. So if you just make a generality, like I'm a problem solver, I've got real great team skills, it is the most useless statement I've ever heard. I'm going to almost discount the person right away. The reason is, is that, so let me, now I'm going to go back. I must have debriefed, it had to be two to 3,000, could be more. You got to remember, 25 years I was a full-time recruiter. Anywhere from five to ten interviews a week, 20, 30 a month, I'm debriefing the hiring manager, I'm debriefing the candidate. When I listen to hiring managers about why they like people, they always describe an example that the candidate had. They don't say this person had great team skills. They said, ah, the person told me about this, this project they were on, and as a result of that example, I've concluded they have great team skills. So what you're doing is you're giving the person the evidence that you have great team skills, not assuming they say it and believe it because you've said it. So the idea is, and what I have here is, how you prove it is using a structured uh, pattern for answering questions. This is the one to two minute, that shouldn't say one to one dash two SAFW answers, it's one to two minute SAFW. Let me explain what that is. This is how you answer questions. This is how you prove a strength and neutralize a weakness. SAFW is an acronym for standing, at, standing for say a few words. Answers have to be one to two minutes long. If you're 20 to 30 seconds, it's just too much work. You're just going to be blown away before uh, the interview is even, even 15 minutes over. Managers don't have that many questions to ask. They don't know how to interview. So if you just give, hey, tell me about this, tell me about that, and you give little 10, 15, 20 second answers, they're, they're over. Uh, they just don't care because part of the interview is not just the content or the, what you say, but it's also how you say it. If you're two to three minutes long or longer, you're so boring and self-absorbed, people tune you out after a minute and a half to two minutes. So two minutes is kind of like the right answer. But there's a structure to that two minutes. First off, it's make an opening statement. Well, I really believe one of my great strengths is team skills and collaborating and influencing other people. Amplify that statement. For the last two jobs I've had, I've been, signed, I've been assigned to multifunctional teams to work with marketing, engineering, and manufacturing and really act as the, the bridge between the technical people and the, the lay talent. They just really don't get it. And that really seems to be the area where I can really help clarify that communication. Let me give you a specific example of where that means. So when the, the statement is 10, 5, 10 seconds, the application is 5 to 10 seconds, the example is what counts. The example is what counts. Then wrap it up. So based on what I've just done there, it seems like a lot of the jobs I get always seem to be consistent with that where you have these different groups aren't communicating, and that's really what I would say my key strength is to bring all these different parties together and clarify so we can move forward collectively in a proper manner. Now, and sometimes you'll get nervous, you won't remember this. But what I always say is always think about the example. If you just forget everything else, say, uh, let me tell you, let me give you, my real strength is team skills, let me give you an example. Let me give you, you can always just, I got to get examples, 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 examples. People remember the examples. Now, from my perspective is to be prepared, write down your five or six greatest strengths and come up with a story for each of those. I'm great team skills, I'm great technical, I, I'm totally committed. Whatever it is, put a story down to prove that strength. You whether I like the question, what's your, what's your weakness or not, it's immaterial whether I like it or not. People will ask you. And if you say, I don't have any weaknesses, really what you're basically saying is you don't know yourself too well. You can't be coached and you stop learning. I mean, that's the worst thing you can say, I don't have any weakness. That's the weakness. You're, you're done. You're as good as you're possibly going to get. Uh, but if you can turn it to a strength, say, hey, you know, I tend to make quick decisions without a lot of the information. That sometimes works very effectively when there's little time. But I've learned that when I have more time, that I just sit back I, and you describe a story about how you've learned to overcome that weakness. Just like the gap. 
that's in some way a weakness because people do look at it. You have to neutralize it. If you can say that uh, you make quick decisions without looking for it, you can say, well, now I do that. Now I actually have a process of how much time do I have, and you can de describe the point you've made with an example of minimizing the weakness, and sometimes you can turn it to, into a strength. As a result of that, I've realized I've got the ability to take a lot of data, come up with a uh, quick decision, and then go through the analysis to see if the decision is correct. But the idea of being prepared is essential. Practicing this is as critical component as there is. JJ, a question related to this? Yeah, does the SASW process work on a phone screen? Should you use it on, if you're doing a phone screen as well as the in-person interview? Yeah, this is great. This is a good heads up. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I would say if you're on a phone screen, let's be real frank, guys. I know recruiters are going to be asking, just seeing if they, you fit the big boxes. And if you don't fit the big boxes, and you can do this whether it's a live interview on site or a phone screen, just ask the manager or the interviewer, would you mind giving me a quick overview of the job and some of the big challenges the person in this role is going to face? What I'd like to do is give you an example of something I've done that's most related to that. Now, the purpose of that is now they say, oh, what we need to do is we have to improve the operations in this department because they're going a little bit haywire. And you say, well, can I ask you a few, you ask a few questions about it and say, oh, let me give you an example of something I've done that's most related to that. Now, all of a sudden, and use this SAFW remark. Oh, what happened at about a year and a half ago when I was at this job, I had exactly that same situation. Here it was. This is why being prepared with those examples, you already know what you're going to talk about. And you can ask about what are the challenges. If they come up with two or three challenges, you probably have one or two that you've done. I call that the divide and uh, conquer approach, which you can do live or online. That same approach, also if you have a weaker first impression, I would almost, I judge everybody, hey, if you have a weak first impression, make sure you have a phone screen and use that exact same process. That's so critical because now you're going to be judged on your performance, not your first impression. I would even say if you make a good first impression, still do it. But people get nervous. Not everyone is, makes this perfect first impression. I personally don't care. I will not meet a person in person the first time. I always conduct a phone screen. I always ask, hey, tell me about your biggest accomplishment related to the job. That's what it says in the book to do. Most interviewers won't do it unless they've read the book. And if they have read, if they do ask you that question, you'll already be able to answer it. If they haven't asked it, you can turn it around. What's your biggest challenge? I'd like to give you an example of something I've done. So that's a great, great question. Uh, let me kind of just go on to these blunders, and we'll open it up to as many questions as we can, JJ. So guys, put in your good questions. Hopefully you're finding some good ones here. I haven't been stumped yet. I know we said if anybody can stump me, I sent them a free copy of the book. Isn't that what we're doing, JJ? Sure, we can do that, Lou. Because I have to be, I'm the judge if I stump, if I've been stumped or not. So, well, maybe we could do, uh, push, maybe, we, is there a way they can do a stump? Is there somebody who can raise their hand? Or I guess they can all ask questions. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Let's not uh, meander here. Okay, here's some blunders. And this is, so in some way, it's generalities and hyperboles. Hyperbole, excuse me, generalities and hyperbole. Managers and interviewers do not remember general statements. I'm a problem solver. I've got great team skills, which are the standard ones. I must have heard that a thousand times. My immediate reaction is, well, tell me about the biggest problem you've solved. Or tell me about the biggest team challenge you've faced. But most managers aren't going to do that. They just, you're thinking, oh, I told them all about this. I told them I love this kind of work. It's, it's, it's not remembered. It's at the conscious level. And I guarantee when they, at the end of the day, they're going to write their notes about the person. They will say, yes, Tracy. I'm, not, I'm just looking at Tracy's name here. Yeah, Tracy, well, I mean, yeah, she told me about this project she handled that she was thrown in. It was above her head, but she had to deal with engineering and manufacturing and had this real production scheduling problem. Yeah, she's got great team skills. That's what people remember is the examples. So if you're going to make this is why the SAFW forces you to come up with an example. It forces you to. But when you get nervous in an interview, you kind of forget. That's why I suggest, guys, you got to write this stuff down. Write it before you get there. So even if you do get a little bit nervous, you say, well, let me, even your stomach would loose, say, he said, oh, yeah, give me an example. Just think. So once you say something, you say, let me give you an example of what I mean. It's probably the best thing you can ever use in an interview. Let me give you an example of what I mean, then give the example. Examples are remembered. Generalities are quickly forgotten. So that's point one. That's big blunder. Don't avoid that one. I want to go with four of these, and then we'll open it up for some questions. I already talked about neutralizing first impressions, so I don't want to do it 
I tend personally, and I recommend just my firm is probably trained 2,000 interviewers, now probably more this year. We train interviewers, recruiters, hiring managers, and we tell them all the biggest problem you're going to make, the number one cause of errors is judging a candidate on first impressions. Number one mistake. Competency is really easy to measure. Motivation to do the work is hard to measure. But most people measure motivation based on superficial stuff, your handshake, your eye contact, all a bunch of hokum. Yeah, you should be there five to ten minutes early. Absolutely. Being late, which I couldn't, you know, if you're going to be late, tell them. Don't be late. Judge, people will think you're the uh, most useless, irresponsible person if you're late. Right or wrong, that's the judgment they will make. So don't be late. But I would suggest that if you can get a phone screen before, based on how I said it, where people know a couple of your accomplishments, a team accomplishment, an individual accomplishment, you're in the game. Now they're focusing on performance from the get-go. Now here's another one I tell candidates. So let me kind of, if you were my candidate, if every one of you are my candidate, I'd be, oh, you're going to go out in interviews next week. Do not ask self-serving questions. If anybody asks a self-serving question, I'm not going to represent you. Pretty much that's what I'm going to tell you all in this big hall. You're all going to get ready. I'm going to say, from the first, even I know all you people are pretty cool, but you've got to sell yourself each and every individual, each and every interview. So you're going to have all four interviews throughout the day. And you start, people, candidates start getting comfortable. And they think, ah, I got the third person, I was the first and second person already liked me. No, you've got to start over with every single person. Even if you go back to see the same person again, until they say we want to hire you, don't ask self-serving questions. Self-serving questions relate to day one. What do I get? What money do I get? What's the title? What's the compensation? What's the vacation package? What's the benefits? Those are self-serving questions. If they say, hey, Tracy, we'd like to hire you, uh, let's, let's get into some of the, the package we're offering, that's fine. If you want to just do general ranges, that's fine. But the focus should be on, hey, what are some challenges you have here? Uh, what are some big things? Let me prove to you that I can do it. I might not say those words, but I, I just really bugs me when candidates start focusing on what do they get rather than what they can comp, uh, produce and what they can accomplish. Now, let's be real frank. A job consists of three big buckets. What you get, which is the day you get, and that's not unimportant. It's what you do in year one uh, and what you can become if you do uh, that work well. Until you know what you can do and become, what you get becomes less important. And if you're economically desperate, still focus on what you can do and become. And if, if what you can do and become makes sense, I guarantee companies will modify what you get to make it work for you. But too many candidates focus too much on what they get and not enough what they're going to do and what they can become if they do it well. So I just tend to say, and you've got to recognize that there are lots and lots of people looking for the same job sometimes, but if you can focus on what you can do and become, the getting will take care of itself. You also demonstrate your character, also you, how you make judgments, that you're focusing on both the short-term and the long-term, not just trying to optimize your short-term benefit. And that's why I say when you get a job, you have an opportunity to prove yourself. It's what you do is how you get more, rec uh, more referrals and for the next job. So every job you take, is gonna, you get an opportunity to develop 20 uh, contacts for future networking for the next job and the next job after that. And I think more and more people are recognizing, and I know some of you are going to get that first job to start, but every job uh, you have an opportunity to, to develop a robust and powerful network as long as you, people can. And the goal is, hey, is this person going to vouch for my performance? So you got to be look at it constantly. This 360 performance reviews that are ongoing continually 24-7. Uh, final piece I want to give here, and then I'll ask lots of questions about these points. Do not look at your resume. During the interview, I mean, during the interview, let me restate that. During the interview, do not look at your resume. The reason, and I've interviewed thousands of people, and I know people get nervous. And I know that when you get nervous, you become a little forgetful. So when people look at their resume, logically I can believe it's because they're nervous. But logic in an interview for the interviewer isn't always present. So the assumption is made that you fabricated your information. Right or wrong, that's the instant judgments. That's the default is, ah, the person probably fabricated this. Uh, they put the wrong dates down. I want to say they don't want to be caught in some kind of uh, awkward situation. Now, right or wrong, that's the assumption. 
So it's better, and I tell my candidates, do not look at your resume. Don't even bring one. Have it memorized. Every date, every title, every month, every detail. So when you put your examples together, months, dates, years, specifics, metrics, time. Okay, I took this job. It was about $7 million budget. Uh, in total, I was responsible for all the engineering design work on that budget. Had three people doing it. We did it in, I think it was July of 2009. Went to uh, January of 2010 we accomplish this, this, and that. That's the kind of information you need when you give your example. That's why you got to prepare, prepare, prepare. And then just before you go into the interview, you write all those key details down on a 3 by 5 card. You don't look at the 3 by 5 card either. I wrote an article about this, and somebody said, you don't look at that. That's just a, and you write it down. You, maybe you could, uh, maybe, I, I just think writing is better than typing, but I could be wrong about that, so I'm not going to hang up on that. The idea is you will get nervous. If you're prepared, you'll become less nervous. And what I even say with the, the SAFW response is come up with your three or four biggest strengths and come up with an SAFW response for each one of those. Practice with your children. If you've got a kid who uh, is over five and under 12, uh, have that person ask you the question. You will be so embarrassed, it'll be so awkward, it'll be worse than when you get to the interview. Then you'll know it. Hey, I can get through this. You can have your spouse ask you the question in practice. That's even more intense, because your spouse will be more critical. But it's good practice. So I just say you've got to practice almost getting nervous, but so that you realize, hey, it's only going to last five or ten seconds if you practice. If you if you don't practice, it'll last a half a minute, and that's almost too long. But five or ten seconds, you can uh, you'll get through it, and you'll just come up with a couple of dates, and then all of a sudden you'll uh, you'll you'll realize that hey, the nervousness would block your subconscious memory clears up and you got the data, data back. So I think this is a, those are four important points and I think so many people make these mistakes. So let me kind of open questions for anything we have here, JJ, specifically on this, but I'll answer just about anything you got. Uh, yeah, gosh, lots and lots of questions. Uh, when you're networking and establishing that network, how far back in your work experience should you go for networking? At, at, in other words, at, at what point in your history does it become irrelevant? Well, that's a great question. I, in my opinion, it's irrelevant if the person can't recommend you to somebody who's worthwhile. So if you had a professor 10 years ago, and I'm thinking, I went to UCLA and I just had this professor. I went there, guys, I've got 30, maybe 40 years, oh my God. It's, all, it's almost embarrassing. And I actually, somebody came up, to, I met somebody for coffee who was fundraising at UCLA, and she mentioned this professor is still there. I said, oh, I had him. Uh, so that guy is well connected. He was running the entrepreneurial school at UCLA. Uh, he's still around. So now I'm not looking for a job, uh, and I'd be too old to get one regardless, but that person is still relevant. On the other hand, you could have somebody who you met with four years ago who doesn't know anybody. That's irrelevant. So I don't think it has to do with how far you go back. It turns out, does this person know other people who can he, he or she can recommend you to? So therefore, if you have a professor 10 years ago who's doing some consulting work in industry or knows people, I think that would be perfectly appropriate. So I think it's a very fair question, but I don't think it has to do with time. It has to do with relevancy. Does this person know anybody? And if they still all might, but as long as they can recommend you to somebody else, you're still in the game. As long as you can push it forward, I guess, is really the key. Great. Okay. During the 10-second uh, uh, resume discussion you had a while ago, is there something that recruiters value higher than job seekers that should be highlighted in that 10-second evaluation? I don't really understand that question, JJ, so I'll answer a different question. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, it will be related to that, though, whomever asked it. The point of the 10 seconds is that's human nature. I've actually sat with recruiters as they've looked at their screen. So when you look at what a, what a recruiter gets, they get a, an ATS called Applicant Tracking System, or they use LinkedIn's uh, CRM system. Regardless, when you do a search for a bunch of resumes, you get a list of searches. Hopefully, you can just click on that, and it pops up a small blurb of the candidate. It's almost three by five size. Uh, and, and sometimes the algorithm to take from your resume to that summary isn't all that perfect. But let's assume they could look at your resume. I know that people are only going to look at it for 10 seconds and make some judgment in this A or B. Judgment A is I'm not going to look at it anymore. Judgment B is, is I need to spend 30 more seconds looking at it. Now, they don't actually say it in those words, but that's what they do. Remember that a corporate recruiter could have anywhere from 20 to 30 or 40 uh, requisitions. So they decide, hey, I just did a resume search. I'm going to look at all the candidates who have applied. The system 
they don't even do it. The system brings, this is the top 50 that best match the resume. Well, I've got 20 other searches I've got to do today, 20 other jobs I've got to fill, so they can spend five minutes looking at those 50. I don't know if that's, if they divide, that's exactly 10 seconds, but that's what they're doing. Hey, i got to go through it, got to go through it, got to go through it. They're looking at, hey, is it worthwhile spending more? So I always tell people in that 10 seconds, that line in LinkedIn profile, because a lot of people are using LinkedIn now, that line under your name is very important. I then look at the title of your company, uh, your company, and the title you've had there. If you've had, uh, if you've been promoted at the company, oh, if you've been at XYZ company, had job A, job B, job C, and they're getting better jobs. At the prior company, that was pretty cool, and they got job A, B, and C, and they got these academics. Literally, that's all you've got. So I'm looking is if these persons with credible organizations, and they've done something credible, uh, and is you know, almost their brand, their brand which is under their name, does that even make sense? And sometimes it doesn't, but it's kind of you have an, an opportunity to present yourself in an unusual way. Uh, but if you say, I'm a problem solver, that isn't going to happen. But if you said, I solve complex uh, fluid design problems using XYZ technology, well, that would be kind of, you know, that might just be the fit. All of a sudden, that's the thing that stands out. So I think that's why you have to look at it. So I, I don't know if that was the, the question, but I thought it was a great answer. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Uh, so is that there was a my question? best answer, JJ. I, was, I don't hear anybody clapping here. I thought that was my best answer, but whatever. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, Luke. So is there a question that uh, job seekers can ask during interview that will set them apart, make them stand out from other applicants? Yes, absolutely. That's a great, that is a great question. It's not a stumper, but it's a great question. And I think it kind of summarizes a lot what I've said. It goes back to don't be box checked. So what I tell in the first three or five minutes of an interview, you know if that interviewer is any good or not. I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting there. Are you being judged properly? I would say four out of five times you will not be judged properly. Number one, there's so many people that are trying to make it a transaction. You're probably not perfect match. So the way to take control of the interview is by asking a very important question. The first question is, would you mind describing, you know, I looked, I looked at your job description, it wasn't very clear. Would you mind giving me a little overview of some of the challenges the person facing in this, this person taking this job will face? The idea is that yes, they got to come up with a new system to do this, they got to close the books faster, they got to upgrade it, they got to buy the, but whatever it is, they've got to do stuff. If they tell you two or three things, since you're already prepared, number you ask the question about challenges, oh, let me describe something I've accomplished that I think is most related to that, and then tell them an example of something using the SAFW format that makes most sense. So that to me is the most important question. Let me also say that when I've debriefed uh, hiring managers, and I've sat in sessions where they've evaluated three or four candidates, generally they're my candidates I presented, they focus on almost three things. The quality of the first person's first impression, the quality of the person's answers, and the quality of the person's questions. Now, the question I just defined is to get the right answer about performance. And if you really have good accomplishments and ask good questions, you, if your first impression is a little weak or not, it almost doesn't matter. So you can minimum, and if you don't have the full complement of skills, it almost doesn't matter. So think about it. You're being, let's say it's four things. You're being judged on your skills and experience, your first impression, the quality of your accomplishments, and the quality of your questions. If you don't have a perfect fit, but you're in the interview, you got, uh, hey, you're in the game anyway. They will make a judgment about your first impression, good or bad. I think it's stupid, let me tell you this. I, I spend a lot of time uh, not judging people on that. My best people have, quite frankly, my, the best people I've ever placed have average first impression. Some get nervous, but the one thing they have in common, they're all great workers. They're all committed. They're all responsible. They get things done. They don't make excuses. They, they, get, they do it. Those are my best candidates. I couldn't, if I find people like I don't care what their first impression, I don't care what they look like, I'm going to work like heck to make sure uh, they get put in there. I don't always win, but I'm still going to work like heck. Now, when I talk about the four things, skills, first impression, the quality of their answers, which is all I've done here, that little response is I've gotten the hiring manager, the interviewer to ask you the right questions. Is hey, tell me about your biggest accomplishment related to this and that. So you're kind of forcing that question. The other questions I'm talking about are not self-serving. You ask self-serving questions, 
they will be remembered, even if you think they're important. And I don't want to say that they're not important, but they give people a bad reputation. Uh, this person only cares about what they get from it. But if you ask, how does this job relate to the business strategy, that's a great question. Hey, I looked at your website and I see that you're developing a whole new line of products that do this. Does this job relate to that? Because it seems like there's a discontinuance between your marketing and your product development. That's a great question. I understand you're hiring a lot of people in customer service. Is that to support this group or that group? Wow, you didn't even know we were doing that. So the idea of, as I said, there's four things, skills and experience, first impression, quality of your answers, quality of your questions. Those are going to be judged. If you answer great questions with accomplishment, here's what I've accomplished with the SAFW, and you ask great questions, you're in the game. Now, does it mean perfect? No, it's not always perfect, but at least you're in the game. JJ, yeah, let's kind of, let me do this and we'll ask a couple, let me just kind of wrap it up and we'll ask a couple other questions, okay? Answer a couple others. Okay. Again, I'll, I'll open it up. I want to make the statement, this is the other half of the infomercial, which is not great. I do have a book. It has a lot of the content I've talked about in it. As you'll see, it's geared largely to hiring managers on how they should do it right. Most of them won't do it right, so there's also advice given as to how you make sure they do it right. And that's what I say is how do you reverse the reverse engineer the interview so you're measured based on the quality of your accomplishments. The price isn't that high, guys. It's, if you're serious about a job, it's pocket change. Let's be real frank. It is pocket change. One hour at minimum wage. So give me a break about it. We do have this new video series we've just launched. I think it's just launched today. I'm not positive. We're working with Open Sesame, which is a big, it's like the Amazon of videos. They've decided, hey, we're going to offer this program at an 80% discount. I, and you'll hear all the details. I believe that 80% discount will be effective only through Sunday. I'm not positive. Uh, then we go to the normal pricing. So, uh, and I haven't really worked that detail. Somebody just told me that was the deal. But number one, the first video you should listen to because it, it's free. The first video, there's no cost, and it's, so you should just go there and listen to it, and then you'll have a sense if you want to do the whole video. So let me open it up to, we've talked about, I'll just restate this. The reason I don't like applying to a posting, it's a waste of time. It makes you feel good, but it's busy work that has no payoff unless you're a perfect fit. Somebody earlier asked about attending networking events. Yes, they're okay, but that's not real networking. That's social networking. In my mind, real networking is the hard work of finding people who can vouch for your performance and get recommendations. Here, you're just hoping that somebody's got a job in hand, and it's in some way it's akin to a live job board. Hopefully, something mix and matches is when you're doing it there. So, yeah, you got to meet people, but to me, the best way to, to do networking is in every job you have, uh, outproduce everybody else. Don't make excuses. Make it happen. Um, and the hidden job market, to me, I'm going to say it's before the job is officially posted. 50% of all jobs are filled in the hidden job market. That's why you want to do networking to get in the hidden job market. I'm just going to summarize it this way, JJ, then I'll have a few more questions. for. We'll take two or three more questions. The hidden job market is different. You focus on performance and potential. You get there using a 20-20-60 job hunting plan with the emphasis on networking, but using that job rec to see if you can network in. Hey, job rec is still important. You still got to look for them. Don't always apply. Use it as a lead to get in. Also, when you're judged on networking, and a lot of what we, I've talked about is getting judged on your performance and potential by asking questions about your performance. Known people are automatically judged on their performance. An unknown person can be judged on their performance rather than their skills and experience by asking, what are some challenges in the job? Let me describe something I've done that's most important. You've shifted the focus to something that's much more accurate. And you demonstrate, hey, you're, you're confident enough to take control of the interview. So that's a game changer. The way you're going to get more interviews, though, is by networking. And I'm going to contend it's at least 20 times more effective that you'll get a job and get a better job by networking than applying to a posting. It could actually be 100 times, but I'll go 20 being conservative. And again, networking is not about meeting as many people as you can. It's meeting as few people as you can who can recommend you to other people and doing that over and over again. It is hard work. It is bruising to the ego. It is hard, but eventually it will pay off. At some point in time, a week or two later, if you do it, meet five or six people every day uh, and, get new, and get recommendations from these people, at some point in time, somebody will say, hey, you know, I know somebody's looking for that job. What a coincidence. It was no coincidence, guys. It was part of hard work and getting recommended by people who can vouch for your performance. 
that will be a great day. That's what we've talked about today. That's the whole point of this job seekers. I've dedicated the book. I think I've actually dedicated the video too, but I'm not positive of that. Dedicated the book, not only to hiring managers who made dumb hiring decisions, but to every job seeker who wants to get a better job and one they deserve. So let me open it up. I think we've got one or two time for one or two questions. JJ, let's do it. I'll take, yeah. uh, I can handle a few of those. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a lot of great ones. Uh, how important is it to have an online presence, some things like LinkedIn, Twitter? Do recruiters and, and employers really look at that stuff? And if so, how expensive should they be? Okay. <clears throat> I just think I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> uh, no, let me say LinkedIn profile mandatory. That's not even that's not even uh, optional. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I assume you're not very good. So now, maybe if you're 22, it's different. But if you're 25 or older, you're a professional. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, something why doesn't this happen? You're hiding something. So that's number one, and that should be professional, and really describe it the way I've done. Because you'll get 10 seconds on the LinkedIn profile too. Uh, now, all the other stuff, your Facebook your Twitter feeds and all that kind of thing. And I was just talking with a talent leader yesterday who's into this, and I think we both agreed um, that nobody's going to look at that ahead of time. But if you're down to the final three or four, people will absolutely look at that. Because all of a sudden, okay, now I've got these, let's do a little deep, what's the public background about this person? So then you really will start getting looked at. So it's important, and we also know it's interesting, because I was somebody was telling me about this HR technology that they can tell, a company can tell now if their employees, if their employees are thinking of leaving. The reason they can tell is because they can look at their person's Facebook account and they're starting to clean it up, or they've updated their LinkedIn account. So interesting. I mean, there's a we think the hidden market. It's kind of scary out there. I said, "Ooh, that's kind of interesting." I didn't particularly like it, but that's what's happening. So neither here nor I like it or not. That's what's going on. So yes, I think people look at it, but. Clearly, the LinkedIn profile would be right away. But if you're a candidate, the, not everybody, but I would say a third to 50% will look at the other stuff just to see if there's any damaging information. On the other hand, if you're referred, it doesn't really matter. It's, you just get you get being referred, guys. Even by a second or third degree connection, you, you don't get a free pass. But I tell you, it's a different market. And so that's why I say the hidden market is totally different. It's the it's it's, it's a better market. All this other stuff, the the public market's a bunch of hokum. But yeah, I know you got to play in it. The hidden market is where I would suggest you play, and I try to play in the hidden market as a recruiter. That's what I'm trying to do. I have a lot more flexibility. If the job is already posted, I'm kind of hamstrung here, so I try to get uh, recs before they're fully open that I work on. Let's take one more question, JJ, because we've got to run here and where time is out. I'll take one more question. Okay. Is there a preferred way for job seekers to follow up after an interview? Boy, that is a great question. I, if I had to just say and I can actually feel frustration, is that because recruiters have so much work to do, they don't do, I'll call the customer service component properly. And they come up with this phony customer satisfaction or candidate uh, hand-holding, whatever you might want to call it, it's not the right term, but something like that, uh, where you get this standard letter to follow up. Uh, I'm going to make, and this is not positive, but if you don't get called back, guys, you're not going to get the job. I know that sounds terrible, and you want to find out. And I even I, I mean, I, when I'm getting into these searches, sometimes you just don't have time to do the, the common courtesy, which I know is appropriate, and every single recruiter knows it's appropriate. But if, if they're going to hire you, they will call you back. Uh, if they don't, they're not. So now, given the realities of it, yes, you can send an email, you can call, you can post. You will not, and I, to me, that is probably the biggest black hole there is, and unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for it. If, and I, I just don't. I just know it exists. I know what happened to my desk. I know what happened to people who work with me and the recruiters I work with. It is a black hole, and it's unfortunate. Um, but it will not happen. Let me just say this. If you've been networked in, it won't happen because that person who referred you, you get everything changes in the public market. They will call you back. They will tell you that you didn't get hired. They will tell the person who referred you. They'll tell you the coworker who they it's just a different market, and it's and it's almost the public market is a meat market. And I had to say that, and I just say hey, I'm not going to work there. That's why that's why I almost kind of say, guys, you guys working the meat market expect that to happen, and it's hard, and I know, and it's frustrating. And I wrote an article this morning. The reason we got 3.6 million open jobs in the United States and never get filled is because somebody's trying to match skills and experience to somebody's resume that says skills and experience, and that's a bad matching tool. If you can focus on performance and potential, the game changes. 
That's what really this course is about, guys. How do you get into the hidden market and make yourself be judged based on your performance and potential, not your skills, experience, and industry background? You do those things, work in the hidden market, you will get the job you deserve. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope this was helpful. I look forward to talking with you again. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, Lou, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. You will be getting a follow-up email in your inbox in about an hour, and that will have some of the information that Lou covered today, so be looking for that in about an hour. We look forward to seeing you on future Adler Group webinars, and have a great afternoon.